And in particular, if you're thinking about these things from a policy perspective, they matter to the way policy is going to uh, interact with the economy. Now, much of what I'm going to be saying today uh, is summarized in my chapter with Natalie Bao. It's forthcoming in the Handbook of e uh, Family Economics, so if you want to see a fuller uh, description of this, I, I would uh, urge you to go there. Um, the, this talk is also a bit unusual and not necessarily focused so much on my work, but really on the whole field. What I'd like is for the people, particularly PhD students and young assistant professors and old professors too, is to take away from here is that taking the family seriously and incorporating it into your analysis is a very interesting uh, thing to do, and this is a very dynamic field in economics. Okay. So you might want to start with some definitions, which I don't particularly love doing, but let me do it nonetheless. So you could have a, a, a definition for family. You see that I've one I've put up here on the slide. It's the smallest group of individuals who see themselves as connected to one another. It fulfills basic human needs, providing for children, uh, regulating sexuality, passing property, and knowledge. And knowledge is also culture between generations. That's uh, more of an anthropological view of family culture. There's a million and one definitions. I've just put the one from the dictionary there. And again, it's the customary beliefs, social forms, material traits of a particular group. But it also is human knowledge, belief, and behavior that's transmitted from one generation to the other. Now, for those of you who think about institutions primarily, you might question whether a family is an institution or whether it's culture. And I don't think this is a very useful distinction in general, and I'm sometimes sorry when the economics literature goes there. We don't distinguish between the two. We think, and here I'm quoting a paper by Schultz and co-authors, of the family as a set of culturally, culturally transmitted norms that influence a broad set of social relationships and that shape patterns of marriage, residence, relatedness, alliance formation, and configure social networks in ways that profoundly influence social incentives and behavior. So I won't get into this whole institutions versus culture. I tend to think of institutions more as formal institutions, and the family, of course, is an informal institution for the most part. There is a lot of variation in traditional family institutions and cultural practices that govern the way the family acts. They govern the form that social unions, such as marriage, take place, what legitimizes them, who inherits, who supports parents in their old age, and who is considered a family member. And I'm just going to give you very, very quickly just an idea. Um, this is ancestral family practices, but of current population groups, but it's not necessarily their practice, it's rather the ancestral ones. This is a patrilocality. And we're going to come back to this later. Uh, I just want to show you that the places that are darker is where patrilocality, which is when people go and live in the house or community of um, the parents of the, of the husband, of the newly formed couple of the husband, that, uh, as you can see, that has some span across the globe. And here, for example, is another practice at a bride price. And again, you can see how it uh, varies across the globe. So the first thing I'm going to do is nothing related to my own research, but it's very interesting. I wanted to give you more macro outcomes in some sense of why the family matters. And what anthropologists do is that they very much distinguish between places where you, know, you have a small nuclear family that's not particularly embedded in social networks in large kinship groups and those where kinship groups are tight. And one particular type form or intense form of kinship is that of segmentary lineage and conflict. So here I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a really interesting paper, Moscona, Nunn, and Robinson, uh, about a particular form of kinship, intense kinship relationships, which is a segmentary lineage system and how that relates to conflict. So, a segmentary lineage system is, has unilineal descent. That is, you trace your descent through the father, which is patrilineal, or through the mother, and that's what makes a matrilineal system, as opposed to, say, in a nuclear family, you trace it 
through both, the father and the mother. Now, a segmentary lineage system uh, has subsets or segments uh, of, a full lineage, uh, of, of a full lineage. They function as autonomous groups. So those small little circles that you see there, those ovals, those are all uh, different segments of, uh, of a particular lineage. And you can see that triangle, this is only showing men, so those triangles are men only, and you can see they start with one person and then they segment off and they keep on segmenting off forming a, a lineage. And what the authors do is to say, there's, there might be a relationship, and this had been proposed already in anthropology, but had not been studied rigorously, between having a segmentary lineage and conflict. Why would that be? Well, in a segmentary lineage, if, say, that individual that you see down uh, on your left-hand side, with, denoted by an, uh, one, has a conflict with the individual on your right-hand side, denoted by nine, then what one would do is expect to form, uh, have an alliance and help from everyone who is in that major segment A. And everyone, uh, and the one, uh, the individual number nine, would have an alliance with everybody in segment section B. So any conflict between one and nine would, um, uh, you know, expand to encompass both major segments aligned against one another. And you can see why you might think that conflict would be broader and take longer to resolve. So uh, the authors study this in, uh, uh, in Africa, where you have segmentary versus non-segmentary lineage. Uh, these maps are a little bit hard to distinguish, but the, dark, the first one on the left uh, is showing you in dark ethnic groups that come from segmentary, the light gray are non-segmentary, and the other ones are not in the sample. And then on the right, which looks very much like the one on the left, because it might be hard to distinguish, it has little dots, which are the uh, conflict incidents as measured by the ACLED between 97 and 2014. So the authors do a lot of this, and I'm just, not, I'm just going to show you uh, two results. One is these partial correlation plots, which look at uh, the log of conflict and segmentary lineage conditional on country fixed effects and a whole host of geographic and historical controls, and the historical controls have to do with the ethnic group, how kind of uh, how politically centralized it was, et cetera. And as you can see, no matter what type of conflict we're looking at from A through D, you see a positive relationship in these scatter plots between, and these par partial correlation scatter plots between, on the y-axis, the number of incidents, and on the x-axis, the segmentary lineage after parceling out uh, the uh, other uh, variables. The other thing that the authors do to really get rid of, to be able to establish more directly the um, causality, the direction of causality, is to look at ethnic groups that are segmentary versus non-segmentary and compare those that lie right on the border. So take the left to be segmentary, the right to be non-segmentary. The question is, do we see a change in conflict as we move from the right towards the left? Okay, Do we see a conflict in increase because the segmentary uh, group has, might have more conflicts? So that's the question that they're doing. And the reason that they're doing it this, this way is because it's a boundary uh, regression discontinuity. And what they want to argue is that other things would be expected to move smoothly. What would move smoothly? Their historical experience, perhaps, geographic conditions, et cetera. So when they do that, uh, they get the following bin scatter plot. On the right, you see the distance to the border. The border is given by that dashed line. And um, sorry, uh, uh, that dashed line. And then as you go towards the right, you're getting into uh, within the uh, um, the area lived in by the segmentary group on the left, the non-segmentary group, and as you can see at the border, there's a discontinuity. So that was a pretty uh, neat paper, uh, and I think it shows very convincingly the relationship between you know, extensive kinship groups or intense kinship groups and conflict. Where else uh, does uh, kinship intensity raise its head? 
I'm going to talk to you about three things. Individual psychology, uh, per capita GDP, which is just going to be a scatter plot, and then looking more at causation. So when you, uh, there's several authors that have contributed to looking at and hypothesizing about the relationship between the Western church and individual psychology. And the reason that they have, and particularly anthropologists, is because the Western church very early on started with prohibiting certain types of marriages, leveret marriages, marriages where the man married the, uh, the sister, say, of his deceased wife. They started to rule those things out, ban those things. Uh, and then by the early Middle Ages, they ended up banning ma marriages even to distant cousins. Uh, they wanted, promoted marriage by choice. They encouraged new married couples to set up independent households. And by 1500, uniquely in Europe, most of Europe did not have extensive kinship ties, but instead they had monogamous nuclear households, bilateral descent, mother and father, and neo-local residents, meaning that you go and you live somewhere where neither your father, nor, neither the bride's parents nor the groom's parents are living. Um, the idea is that people who grow up with these type of households, as opposed to households with intensive kinship norms, might have different psychologies. This was very much popularized in the relatively recent book by Henrik uh, called Weird, Western Educated, Industrialized, I forgot R means, uh, Rich and Democratic, there we go. And this, uh, and if you, in particular, if you grow up in intensive kinship norms, so you're embedded in these social relationships with many, many people who form your very extended family, that's gonna reward greater conformity, greater in-group loyalty, and it would discourage independence, individualism, and impersonal motivations for fairness and cooperation. Now, all this sounds very negative, and I'm not trying to say that it's bad to have intensive kinship roles, um, kinship norms, uh, but there are going to be certain downsides. So what would be the positive parts? Things like insurance, for example. That's gonna be much easier to maintain if you're an embedded in a social uh, network than if you're an uh, independent nuclear family. But here the question is that they're looking at is one of psychology. This is a paper by Schultz and all, and what they look at is on the x-axis, centuries under the medieval church, and on the y-axis, the cousin marriage rate. So what fraction of individuals uh, currently, uh, you know, uh, basically recently, marry their cousins? And marriage to cousins is not as unusual as you might think. In some parts, some parts of the world, it's 50%. So we're talking about first and second cousins. And here, as you can see, that having spent uh, much, many centuries under a medieval church, you're much less likely to have cousin marriage. Um, here, I, they're showing the two things that really matter to them. One is that there is a negative relationship between the cousin marriage rate and a measure of, what they, of what's called individualistic impersonal psychology, which is measures proclivities towards individualism and independence, lower conformity, lower obedience, and treating, and less likely to treat strangers with the same degree of cooperation and fairness that you would treat your in-group. Okay, and so um, that relationship is obviously negative, and then the same relationship can be shown using the centuries under the medieval churches directly. So this is a psychological relationship. Does it matter? That's something I think is much less clear for economic outcomes. So here's simply a very suggestive graph. Um, this uh, comes from um, a different paper that we, oh, Gosh and uh, co-authors. And what it's showing you is on the x-axis, GDP per capita. And uh, on, this is in uh, logs. And on the right axis, also in logs, the percent of marriages that are between first and second cousins. And as you can see, again, there is a fairly strong negative relationship, but this is simply a correlation. Now, you might ask, why might this, this exist? 
And one answer, uh, which I liked, was given in a paper by Hoff and Sen, a chapter in a book, where they argue that this might hinder mobility. So while these relationships might be very useful in terms of conflict, in terms of providing insurance, when a society is modernizing and you might need a lot of mobility, particularly think about people moving from farms to the cities, then it may not be so, uh, so positive because you would tend to stay behind as you form part of a social fabric, either because you yourself want to stay behind or because you face pressure to stay behind. So now getting a little bit more towards causality, I want to tell you about this paper. It's a recent working paper by Gosh Huang and Squires, which I really enjoyed reading uh, and actually just incorporated now into the handbook, uh, which has to do with cousin marriage bans in the US. So now we really want to get at the question of causality. What they do is they look at the large variation that exists in the United States towards banning marriages between cousins. This started in the late 1850s in the United States with Kansas. And then as you can see uh, on the slide, every decade a few more uh, states joined in. The authors argue that the variation in timing is due to states entering the union and therefore adopting the more recent uh, uh, legislation and also simply idiosyncratic activism. This wasn't the thing that was particularly important for, for the US, but some senator might get it into his, and it was always a his at this point, into his head that this was an important thing to rule out. In any case, what the authors do is to conduct an event study where they compare outcomes for men born in the same state, born in the same decade, and who have high cousin marriage surnames, and they compare those to the same type of men, but who have low cousin marriage surnames. So the only way to really me uh, measure are you marrying your cousin at this point is to go back into marriage records and look at your wife and have the same surname uh, as you did when she was single and, got, and married you. So all these are married, uh, these measures of the surnames comes in the period prior to the reform, prior to 1858, and it's done for the whole US, not at a particular state level. So the authors run the following regression. They look at, um, they look at, uh, sorry. <laughs> they look at uh, outcomes as a function of state cross decade of birth, fixed effects, state cross high cousin uh, cousin marriage surnames, a census year fixed effect, and then what they're really interested in is how, since they're looking at an event study, is how uh, the outcome changes with the uh, decades that pass after the banning in that state of uh, cousin marriages. So let me show you uh, a few results that I found very interesting. The first is, you know, does this legislation have any impact on cousin marriage rates? You'd like to know that it does, otherwise, you know, uh, you, you, it wouldn't make much of a difference, or you would be picking something else up. And the, as you can see, uh, uh, the decade uh, of the ban is at zero over there. And the negative one is not shown because those are people who would be born 10 years before the cousin marriage ban, and consequently, they might be also affected by the ban. And as you can see, there is a drop within the same state for men, and I should be very clear, this is white men. Uh, history for uh, black Americans is completely different here, and many change their names after uh, freedom. So this is for white men uh, only, okay. So, um, as you can see, uh, it really goes down. Even though we don't really know how much this ban was enforced, it obviously had a bite. The next outcome I'd like to show you from their paper is the impact of these bans on different measures of urbanization and mobility, which is what that Hoff and Sen paper was discussing at a more theoretical, abstract level. And as you can see here, these are different measures as we go A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, 
um, these are different measures of urbanization and mobility. The first one is showing you people who are less likely, about three decades later, later, to live in places with small populations. The second one is showing you that they're less likely, again, about three decades later, to live in farms. The third one is showing you that they're more likely to live in urban settings. And the fourth is that they're, when they're picked up in the census, uh, they're more likely, so again, three, day, three birth decades later, uh, to be living in a state different from their state of birth. So interstate mobility has gone up. And lastly, uh, they have several measures of income. None of them are exactly the ones that you might think because there's no way to get wages at this point for the US for the most part. Uh, instead, what they have is um, an income percentile rank where that income percentile rank is based on a decade by decade kind of socioeconomic index based on the years of education needed for you to be in the occupation that you're in. And again, what you see here is that uh, for birth uh, cohorts some three to four decades after the bans are instituted, uh, you see much greater mo occupational mobility or socioeconomic mobility measured this way. And again, I'm just going to emphasize, this is not showing you that the U.S. has become more socially mobile. It's not showing you that the U.S. has become more urban. All this is always comparing people with the same, with high surname, cousin surnames relative to low cousin surnames, born same decade, born in the same state. So it's not picking up a general trend. Okay, enough of those, uh, the, both of those. I think they're very interesting and uh, I, I spent a lot of time learning about these uh, papers when I was writing the, the handbook and modifying it right now at the end. Next, I would like to pass on to the families, cultural beliefs, and practice. So this is where I have worked, and so of course I'm the least excited. I never understand people who are excited about their own work two years later, but in any case, this is many more than two years later, so I don't find it exciting, so I will go quick on it. So um, to study the impact of cultural beliefs that the family brings, people have followed what I've called and, uh, the epidemiological approach. Um, so what the epidemiological approach does is to exploit the fact that beliefs are much more transportable when you move than are your institutions and economic backgrounds, okay? So what people do is that they study usually second generative natives. So suppose people have moved to the U.S. and immigrated to the U.S., you'd be studying the second generation, so the kids who were born in the U.S., uh, who live in the same geographic area, whether it's a city, a town, a commuting zone, and very often you still have un you've transported other things, maybe other than culture, with your parents. Maybe you've transported things that we're not measuring, like wealth or like human capital embedded in your parents or your parents' education. So very often, at least for my own work, I would control for things like similar education level, even if it's taking away some of the impact of culture, because if you don't control for it, you're not really sure you've gotten rid of the other things that get transported when people cross boundaries. Um, so the idea is, again, that people, these individuals, face the same set of institutions, but their choices, their economic outcomes, can differ in a systematic fashion because their parents transmitted different cultural beliefs and the differences somehow are reflecting their country of ancestry, their country of origin and other parents. So this approach has been used to study many outcomes. My own work was on married women's labor force participation and fertility, uh, both on my own and with Alessandra Foley and also Alessina Giuliano and Nan have worked in this area. I'm just gonna show you like the ca classic, classic, I'm gonna show you a scatter plot. On the uh, x-axis I have how much women used to work in 1950 from your, in your country of ancestry. In 1950, neither the parents were there, and certainly these kids were not there. I'm looking at them in 1970, and I'm looking at married women and asking about their labor force participation. Here is the hours worked per week in the US in 1970, given that your parents were born, say, in Lebanon, in Mexico, Spain, Cuba, et cetera. And as you can see, and this is con 
This is just a raw scatter plot and a number of regressions controlling for your own education, your husband's income, your husband's education, uh, to try to get rid of other sources of variation that aren't coming from culture, although you might think that those things would be affected by culture as well, and we find a, a strong positive relationship. This has also been used to study the relationship between various measures of gender roles or uh, sexism, bluntly, um, towards gender gaps in math scores, uh, incidents of intimate partner violence, a different form of, uh, of uh, not gender roles, but a different form of uh, discrimination against women, which would be preference towards sons, and sex-selective abortions. Again, this is all following the epidemiological approach, so this is outside of their country. This is looking at people in a different country. Uh, the traditions of metrolocality and patrilocality, and what we saw before, psychological characteristics, they also apply the epidemiological approach. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm done with that part. Now I want to tell you about two different cultural practices that have to do uh, with marriage payments. Okay, so payments at the time of marriage were really common throughout the entire world, and they typically could be classified as a dowry or as a bride price. And uh, bride price were, are widespread in sub-Saharan Africa, and dowry is still widely practiced in India, but also it's becoming more popular in other parts uh, of, of uh, South Asia. Uh, in modern contexts, we would think that bride price and dowry can be thought of marriage clearing transfers. And as such, you would expect them, and maybe the whole practice, to be affected by things like technological change, environmental change policies, et cetera. And what I want to show you is that the way that the family is organized, its cultural beliefs, can have very different effect depending on what the family practices. So here I'm going to uh, summarize a paper by Ashraf, Bao, Nun, and Voena. And what they do is to look at human capital investments and how that might interact with bride price, particularly when a policy is introduced. So if you uh, ask, well, why does, uh, you know, why do we have certain family institutions? A leading hypothesis is that it helps to, you know, um, compensate for markets that might be missing. On the other hand, even though those markets may no longer be missing, it might take a long time for these cultural practices to disappear. It depends. Now, the authors investigate that the reason that a buy price might exist is because it allows imperfectly altruistic parents to capture some of the investments that they make in their daughter by capturing the uh, marriage market, part of the marriage market returns to education. So the idea is this is the bride price is going to incentivize parents to invest more in, in their child's and their daughter's education if they can get some of the returns via a bride price to that investment. So they look at two countries, Indonesia and Zambia. As you can see, um, there's what they've got, what we've graphed here is people are coming from different ethnic groups. Uh, they have different intent, these ethnic groups have Different, uh, probably different practices, and not all of them come from ancestries that practice bride price. So looking at the current population, both in Zambia and in Indonesia, the darker colors are associated with ethnic groups uh, that, were practiced, that were more likely to be practicing bride price. So both between Indonesia and Zambia, they're going to distinguish between individuals whose ethnic group practiced bride price and those that did not. And it's very important to note that no ethnic group practiced dowry. First, I show that the hypothesis is true in the sense that in both countries, girls receive more education if they come from bride price ethnicities. And they attempt to rule out uh, other explanations, like the parents might be wealthier, uh, maybe they have lower fertility, those parents, and that's why you know, they're wealthier or have lower fertility, which makes them uh, de facto welfare on a per, per child basis, that's what makes them uh, more educated and they rule those out. 
And also the link is there. In both countries, girls with more education receive higher bride price. So education is valued, which is what you need. And then they study uh, two school construction programs. The one that is most famous probably is the one in Indonesia in which they built a large number of primary schools between 1973 and 1978. This was Esther Duclos' paper from a long time back. She studied um, treated versus untreated cohorts in the same district in Indonesia and found that when these schools were introduced, it had a positive effect on boys' education and that this effect was larger in districts with more school construction. That was the point of that paper. It was a long time ago, and it was really showing, okay, I, you know, schools matter, the possibilities for education matter, at least for boys. Subsequent studies, however, did not find any effect on female education. So what Ashraf and her co-authors did was to revisit the setting, but they now distinguish between bride price tradition and those without bride price tradition in Indonesia. And again, they compare treated versus untreated cohorts within the same district, and they find that ethnic groups with a bride price tradition did increase the girls' rate of primary school completion, whereas the other groups did not. So the negative result was really resulting from um, the other groups. Um, but here you see that when there's an opportunity to invest more in girls, these parents did. A similar school expansion happened in Zambia, a longer period, maybe a little bit less neat in terms of thinking about how this was randomized. In any case, once again, they compare against across districts with different numbers of schools. And uh, what they find is that um, there is no effect in general of being in a district with more school for girls. But again, at the district level, if you distinguish between girls from bride price traditions versus non-bride price traditions, you see that the places where the districts with more schooling see increases in schooling for girls that come from a bride price tradition. So your ideas about whether schools are going to make a difference or not really need to take into account what the cultural beliefs of different families are to be able to distinguish its true effects. So now I want to tell you about a different practice, which is that of dowry, and how it interacts with some preference, in particular in the face of gold price shocks. So here I'm talking about a paper by Balotra, Chakravati, and Guleski. And first, a little bit of history. Dowry uh, was, historically, it's very important. It was primarily a bequest, a parental property to the bride. It has disappeared in most of the words, world. It persists in contemporary India despite being prohibited since 1961. It's become more common in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Nowadays, instead of the dowry necessarily going to the uh, bride, it actually is often appropriated by a groom and his family. So it's really acting uh, as a groom price. Okay, this is the price for the men. Um, in India, there's, dowries are very large, sometimes four to eight times annual income, household income. Gold is a very important part of these dowries. Some es estimates range from 70 to 90% of households in India give dowry, and 95% of those who give report giving gold. Uh, given how expensive it is, families start to save for dowries upon the birth of a girl. So, what the authors do is to study the negative effects of the interaction between having this dowry tradition and what happens when gold price increases. And the main idea they're exploring is that an increase in the price of gold is going to make daughters more expensive. It might make sons less expensive since now the son is getting, and, his, and you as his parents, are getting uh, some of that dowry and it's potentially going to lead parents to want fewer girls and more boys. Uh, I want to note from the outset that this argument, this main idea, requires the amount of gold not to adjust completely when the price of gold changes. So a price of gold is gonna make your girl more expensive, but if the amount, if, 
if, sorry, if, the, um, if, if it adjusts it completely, you would be left with you know, paying the same dowry price as before. And the first thing they show is that on, about the, the dowry's value increases by 80% of the percentage price of increase of gold. Now, the price of gold is not determined in India. It's determined on the world market. It's highly variable. I'll just show you the two pictures. It follows a random walk. I won't show you more than that. What the authors do is that they study what is the outcome of, to the second born, of the second-born child. Why the second-born child? Well, there's evidence that families want one girl. And if you were to study third or fourth or fifth-born, there's potentially greater selection in unobservable family characteristics when family have more than two kids. They differentiate between two periods, 1972 to 85, which is pre-ultrasound, and then the period 85 to 2005, in which ultrasounds allows prenatal sex selection. They control for a large set of variables that you can see there, rainfall state, year, birth month, fixed effects, the sex of the first child, et cetera. And they show that increases in the price of gold for the pre-ultrasound period are associated with higher neonatal mortality for girls. So they're more likely to die in the first year after birth if they saw there was an important price increase in gold in the first month after they're born. For the second period, uh, after uh, ultrasound exists, they don't find any effect on neonatal mortality. But instead, what they find is a, a much lower probability that the second child, that newborn, is a girl. So the sex ratio becomes a much more skewed towards boys. So they show further evidence regarding the mechanism. They differentiate between those families with a firstborn born boy relative to a firstborn girl. And they show that the results are driven by those the second born child would have had a sister as a firstborn rather than a brother as a firstborn. It's driven by those. They differentiate on religious grounds, Muslim, Christian, and Hindu, since this uh, uh, practice is much more uh, prevalent in Hindu families than it is in Muslim and Christians, and shows that the results are driven by the Hindu households. And as an interesting uh, further note, they show that the stature of individuals who are between the ages of 15 and 50, prior to being able to have the ultrasound technology, if you were born in a year in which you had higher gold prices, this is associated with women, but not men, being lower height than average. Um, so again, uh, the disfavor, uh, the, the, the discrimination against the girl child. Okay. So I've done all this on culture and showing how it interacts with some policies. Um, now I want to talk about how uh, culture can change. So first of all, there's nothing static about ch culture. Uh, this is often something I have to say to people who even study culture, because often people define it as something that is unchanging over time. There's nothing static about culture. The rate of change of culture is an endogenous variable. And that's the way it should be thought about. So one question that you might ask yourself is, why does culture change? And since we're economists, we think it's going to change in response to changes in incentives. And those changes in incentives are given by, we can call them loosely, shocks, changes in technology, policy shocks, technology shocks, knowledge, environmental shocks. It also can change in response to things that make the ability of others to monitor or to punish transgressors change. So again, culture is not just an internal belief, culture is a social belief, and as such is maintained through rewards and punishments. So the reason that men might here not be wearing skirts today, aside from the fact that it's cold, might be because if you came in in a skirt, everyone would stare at you. So that's a way that culture is going to punish tr transgressors. We will monitor you and kind of look at you strangely. So, but these are just, after all, cultural beliefs. There's nothing to say that uh, men can't wear skirts, just like women some time back could not wear pants. Well, that changed as well. So culture can also get stuck, and that's the important thing to understand is that cultural change, like almost any other change, will create winners and losers. So when people resist cultural change, it's not just because of embedded beliefs, but also because of the damage that changing those beliefs might do to maybe their economic 
prospects or simply their, their span of control. So um, my co-author, Natalie Bao, studied cultural change uh, with respect to pension policies. And this is a very interesting study. She studied the introduction of a pension plan in Indonesia and in Ghana. Indonesia has matrilocal and neolocal ethnic groups, whereas Ghana has patrilocal and neolocal ethnic groups. Again, matrilocal means that they mean and they go and live with uh, the wife's uh, parents. The neolocal, they live elsewhere. And patrilocal, they live with the groom's parents once they're married. Now, why do these practices ex exist? One of the reasons that people speculate these practices exist is because it provides parents with care in their old age. It gives them an additional incentive to invest in the human capital of their kids because they're going to reap some of the marriage market and labor market returns of their kids by having them live with them. Now, in Indonesia, which is matrilocal, so they go and live with the parents of the bride, daughters relative to sons in the same household. So now we're at the household level. So we, we can be sure that we're not missing some uh, information in terms of household wealth or other attributes of the household. Daughters relative to the same house, sons in the same household are more likely to be enrolled in school in matrilocal ethnic groups than daughters versus sons that come from the neolocal ethnic groups. So we do see uh, more investment in girls in those groups. In Ghana, which is patrilocal, sons relative to daughters within the same household are more likely to be enrolled in school if they come from patrilocal ethnic groups than sons versus daughters from neolocal ethnic groups. The question that they study is, what happens when a pension plan is introduced? And the main idea that they're exploring is a pension plan is going to reduce the dependency of parents on their kids which then might affect the reasons that you want to invest in your kids in the first place. Now, if this was a completely stuck cultural practice, it wouldn't be effective. But this investment in kids is going to be affected here, showing how much the incentives matter. So they explore both cohort variations, in particular daughters who would have been too old to receive more education in Indonesia, and different intensity of treatment how the pension plan was rolled out, in particular, how many pension plans offices they are in that district. So they're basically doing a triple difference by also comparing across ethnic groups. And what they find is, for Indonesia, that women's education fell in magical local relative to neo-local ethnic group when these uh, pension plans were introduced. They fell more in those places which had larger pension plans or a more intense pen pension plan rollout. And there was no differential effect on males' education by ethnic group practices. So the pension plan affected culture here in a negative fashion in that they invested less in their daughters. And, but the, the real, that's, you can think maybe education is not a cultural practice, and I would agree in some sense, but what it really affected was a practice of matrilocality. And what they show is matrilocality decreased more for those cohorts that were treated more intensely. They do a similar study for, for Ghana, which also had a pension plan introduced, and they find similar results, but this time for men from patrilocal groups. Those men's education decreased, as did the practice of practicality. The last thing I'm going to tell you before I turn it over to my discussant is uh, to talk to you very briefly about a different sort of modern family, although I won't touch upon the family part, which is that between people of the same sex. So this is a paper on um, why did attitudes towards same-sex relationships change. And what I show you in that graph, this is a paper with Sahar Parsa and also Virengo. Uh, what I show you in that graph is that ever since this question was asked, is it wrong for same-sex adults to have sexual relations, you see that for basically a span of um, you know, 20, 30 years, nothing happened. Okay? Um, basically, the, the share who thought it was either never wrong or some, only sometimes wrong for, for same-sex adults to have sexual relations didn't change. The, what I'm graphing here, just to be clear, is a share who we call approved same-sex relationship, which are the people who answered, it's 
uh, those are the people who answered never wrong or sometimes wrong. What I'm leaving out is the people who answered it's always wrong or almost always wrong. And as you can see, there's a break in the data. We can show this quite rigorously. Between 91 and 93, there's a big upwards jump, and then it takes off. So the people are increasingly approving of uh, same-sex relationships, and I have it graphed until 2017 here. So by 2017, this is in the United States, a representative sample, general social survey, about 60% of people approve. So the first question we ask is, why did approval jump in between 92 and 93? We don't have a, 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 any information for whether it, was, whether it happened in, in 92 or 93. We have 91 and 93 as our data. So in 1981, so 10 years later, uh, earlier, it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Now, the AIDS epidemic did not make people more sympathetic towards same-sex relationships. In fact, if you look closely at the data, you will see that approval went down during this period. What it did, though, was it organized same-sex individuals behind a common cause. You might have been before a gay Republican, a gay Democrat. This was no longer the case. Now you were united. The most important thing was to find a cure for AIDS. Other important things was to find insurance for uh, health insurance for your same-sex partner, etc. So this rallied everyone behind a common cause, and the Democratic Party was more sympathetic towards it on the ground. And so they really start, they created PACs, a very important PAC that still exists today, and gave money to the Democratic Party. So our argument is this: this shock, AIDS, over time, created a very potent political group that had money because it spanned all the income distribution in the US, and that was really ready to be courted. And this, hap this happened at the national level in 1992 during the presidential election, which in the US was Bill Clinton versus George H.W. Uh, George Bush, George Bush Sr., where the Republican and Democratic parties for the first time ever took explicitly opposing stands about gay people serving openly in the military, which was prohibited at that point. So as you know, Clinton won the election, and this gave rise to a public debate in Congress that went on for all of 1993. Uh, it ended up being the compromise, don't ask, don't tell, which is we're not going to ask you if you're gay, and you're not going to tell us. Uh, don't tell us whether you're gay or not. So it wasn't really what was wanted, but it was better than what existed before. And what these two graphs want to show you is that there was a very large jump in media coverage during this time period. If any of you are old enough to remember when we used to get the, the news via evening news, at least in the US, then that's what people watch. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand side in that bluish purple line is a number of news segments dedicated in each year to gay-related topics, where gay-related is by searching for certain key words. And the one in yellow is doing the same thing but for AIDS-related stories. Um, obviously, there's going to be an overlap between gay-related stories and AIDS-related stories, and that dashed line is showing you that overlap. As you can see, 1993, there's a huge increase in gay-related stories. That large increase is not due to AIDS-related stories, as you can see by the fact that that dashed line is going down. That same point, there's a lot more media attention, mainstream media attention, can be seen for newspaper articles, which look at a balanced panel of, I think, 59 newspapers from 1987 till almost 2005, I think it's 2003, and the share of newspaper articles, on average, that are dedicated to gay-related topics, again, searching for keywords, and again, you see the spike in 1993. So there's a lot more attention being given to these uh, uh, topics. What we hypothesize is that the f public debate and the far greater salience of gay-related issues led people to reconsider their positions towards same-sex individuals, and that this initiated a process of cultural change and diffusion of different values over time. Now, this is a national event, and so we can't get variations since it's national, except over time. So what we do is we argue that individuals from places, that is from states, and one point, counties is another data set, with greater exposure to gay individuals, 
and thereby with greater exposure to mobilization, a greater number of grave friends and acquaintances, people are coming out during this period, local news, greater local news, then these places, these uh, three people will be more affected. And you could take this to be either from salience or from contact theory. How do we measure exposure to gay individuals? It's not so easy. We measure exposure to gay individuals via cumulative HIV cases in 1992, or by the proportion of households in the 1990 census who for the first time are asked a question about whether there's another adult of the same sex living there as a partner. Uh, and what we show is that those places of greater exposure are the ones that change their minds the most. That's where you see the greatest impact. Uh, this is, of course, controlling for a lot of things that are different across counties, et cetera. And in particular, there's a state and county fixed effect across these decades, but also income, size of the city, town, sex, race, education, et cetera. So we consider this as an example of how incentives for people to come out, to mobilize, and to organize ultimate led, ultimately led to a process of cultural change once the institutions of the national parties and the media changed their incentives in terms of how much attention they gave to these issues. Okay, let me conclude. I'm a bit over time, I think. Um, so social beliefs and family cultural traditions matter a lot. I hope uh, you've understood to uh, economic outcomes, whether it's women's labor force, gender segregation, time spent with children, especially things that relate to women. The importance of culture in the family's essential role is often overlooked in economics. I think it's very important. I, I, I encourage you to think about it when you're thinking about your research. And I hope that what I've showed you in the last two slides, Sao, is that culture is not destiny. Uh, beliefs change, and often radically in response to other changes. And But that nonetheless, policy, when you're formulating policy, you need to take culture into account without becoming a slave to it. Thank you very much. Slides gonna okay, sorry. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Raquel, for a very, very nice, very, very informative paper and presentation. Um, I'm gonna set my timer for ten minutes, but I see there's a clock over there, so I'm gonna watch there as well. because uh, I still I have ten minutes. But I'm going to be discussing this paper. I highly recommend, Raquel mentioned, you know, going in and looking at the book chapter. Highly recommend it. It is very rich, very informative, and uh, really kind of adds to our understanding, which I'm very happy to see the literature has uh, progressed since, you know, I started studying this in grad school. But really adds to our understanding of the organization of the family uh, and its role in the transmission of culture for economic outcomes. So Raquel had a very, very rich discussion already, and I won't spend too much time summarizing what she already said. But I'm going to highlight three takeaways, and I'm going to give you three main comments as a discussant for this chapter. So first, first takeaway, I think Kel mentioned this and, and reiterated this very well throughout. Culture is endogenous. Very, very important to note this and its implications for how we think about policy. Number two, family is the main structure for transmitting culture. Number three, culture has very real effects on economic outcomes and inequality and vice versa. Right? And this also then I mentioned has very important implications for how we frame effective policy for economic development. So I'm gonna you know, give you three main comments as I mentioned, focused on thinking about how we define culture and why we should care. Uh, when is culture beneficial to economic development, right? So I think there are a number of papers that have shown when culture is detrimental to economic development and trying to see you know, the, the kind of flip side of this. And also uh, suggesting future, future or further areas of study for, for people interested in it doing more on this topic, which I think we should all be interested in doing more on this topic. It's, a, it's again, a very important topic. All right, so defining culture and why we should care. So again, Raquel had a, a very, very nice discussion on this. I just want to highlight some more things here. 
So, so oftentimes my favorite definition, or I should say my favorite definition, is to think about culture as a set of informal institutions, right? So you think about social norms, think about beliefs that influence group behavior and decision making. So that said, it is very, very difficult to define concretely what it is, right? So, so this is me type, trying to type in culture <laughs> into our econ database. Uh, and this is a very, very simple figure that I came up with, right? This is from uh, Alberto Bessin and Verdier. Not simple at all, right? It's very, very, very uh, non-simple. And, and they were trying to kind of outline this, this link between its formal institutions, as we call referred to them, uh, informal institutions, culture, and how these things interact with each other over time. But again, just to highlight how difficult it is to really pin down this definition of what culture is. Okay, on this point on culture being endogenous, then the question is, where does culture come from? So Raquel mentioned this, and this is something that we are learning more about. Culture is affected and is affected by environment. So think about the natural environment. It affects formal institutions and is affected by formal institutions, which then affect, in turn, economic outcomes. So again, going back to the, the, the Bessin uh, and Verdier graph from, from the last figure. So there's a nice paper that I want to highlight on the environment side, which I, you know, I think uh, maybe we didn't get to cover too much in the, in the chapter. I think this so, so just new paper from uh, Bassi, Fisbian, and uh, Gerber Silassi. Uh, I think it came out in Econometrica 2020. And they basically try and link American individualism to this American frontier, right? So you see the picture, you see the, the you know, uh, settlers that go to the West, right? And, and highlight the links between the terrain, the isolation of the environment, uh, how difficult it is to survive in the American frontier to values around, you know, that prize American individualism today by looking at the surnames, I think, of the children, so of, of different generation of, of, of children, or, sorry, not surnames, first names. Uh, and it's very interesting, right? So people start giving their kids much more creative names, and this is what they use as a measure of individualism. Uh, and, and very nice paper kind of trying to, to, to let us know, again, how environment uh, is linked to uh, this, this informal institutions and culture. So, so Raquel very nicely covered the, the role of formal institutions. So thinking about marriage markets, which is uh, something that I also do some work on, and thinking really about the role of bride price versus dowry, right? So I like to, you know, I think we, we might know what they are. You know, this is the transfer from the, from the uh, groom's family to the bride's family. This is Ghana, uh, this is in India, this is a transfer from the uh, bride's family to the groom's family. And Raquel covered this in thinking about how economic shocks, negative shocks, can then have very disparate effects depending on whether you're in a bright price culture or you're in a dowry culture, right? So formal institutions, environment, and these are the things that affect and are affected by uh, culture. So why should we care? So again, Raquel did a very, very nice job going over this. I'm gonna just highlight some things again and highlight this point especially in particular, that not accounting for culture can make your policy interventions fail, right? So what does that mean? So, you know, we, uh, Raquel presented this uh, school constructions paper, a very nice paper from Ashraf et al, that looked at the role of bride price traditions on, the, on female education, right? So by the school constructions that were happening in Indonesia versus Zambia. Um, also very, very nice discussion. I again, highly recommend everyone read this paper on, on looking at intimate partner violence, IPV, and how increases in uh, or, or declines in kind of cyclical male employment is associated with IPV depending on where you are and the cultures in where you are. So they look at developing countries, as the Balotra et al. paper, and then they look at the US and the UK, and you get very, very different signs, right, on the links between cyclical employment of men and women and IPV depending on where you are. And they highlight, again, this idea of male status in societies, this cultural uh, uh, factors as being important in understanding why your signs might flip when you're looking at these uh, effects. Also, another big one, I know there are a lot of <laughs> Development economists in the room, right? Or the Development Economics Conference. So cash transfers, right? So there's a the new kind of body of work trying to understand uh, uh, the effects of cash trans transfers on household welfare and IPV and how that might depend on culture, right? So how women's status within the household, women's bargaining power within the household is viewed, uh, and, and also how kind of challenges to the male image as a breadwinner, especially in very uh, patriarchal societies, might affect then the effects of these cash transfers to households. So we also have very new work, right, so on, on, on online labor markets in Nigeria. I do a lot of my work in Nigeria. And one of the things that stood out to us in the descriptive data paper for coming was that, you know, if you look at just uh, within hiring managers, so looking at hiring managers, looking at applicants that are applying on these online labor markets, 
And you said, okay, what is the effect of gender on hiring in these online labor markets, right? So we're talking about structural transformation. Online labor markets are quite big and they're growing. Everyone has access to ICT these days. So if you just look at gender and you look at the outcomes for hiring, you don't see any effects when you add hiring manager fixed effects. However, when you look at the, inter the interaction between gender and, and co-ethnicity with the hiring manager, then you see quite significant effects, right? So essentially, hiring managers are much more likely to hire co-ethnic men, much less likely to hire co-ethnic women. And what's happening, these women are applying for senior positions within the firm. And so what we think is going on is that, again, cultural norms around, you know, can a woman be senior to me from my group in my workplace? Uh, it is playing a role here in terms of the hiring. But again, if you just looked at gender without considering this, you would say, oh, there's no gender bias. There's nothing, you know, no effect here. So just highlighting again why it's important to study culture. Okay, on the second comment, when is culture beneficial to economic development? Uh, there is a nice body of work going back a few years. So Sam Bowles et al. have talked about, you know, cultural norms as being important, and I think Raquel touched on this, in promoting pro-social or cooperative norms. Right? So like my favorite story, so this is a, he has this book, my favorite story from the book was my study on preschool, um, uh, parents picking their, their kids up from preschool, I don't know if you guys have heard this story. And essentially, you know, economists, the, 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 the teachers were, were, were very upset that parents would come and pick up their children late from preschool all the time. So of course, you know, talk to the economists, what do the economists say, we're all economists, oh yes, provide economic incentives, make it costly for them to pick up their children late. Of course, then what did the parents do? They start picking up their children even later, why? Because now they have completely foregone the pro-social norms of not trying to you know, leave your, your, your students or your kid's teacher there very late because they have families they want to go back to by saying, no, you can just pay. It's now a fee. Pay the teacher and you can leave your kid there for as long as you like. Right? So, so this concern of you know, economic incentives crowding out pro-social norms and the role of culture in promoting pro-social norms, I think it's something that is also very, very important to study here. Okay. My final comment in my last minute. So one of the, th the, the, the kind of thinking about the further areas of study, I think uh, this is less covered in the, in the chapter, which is again very rich, so I would completely understand, not much, you know, not much space to cover everything. But think about the role of religion, right? I think this, this, this literature on the economics of religion is very, very exciting, very, very important, considering the huge role religion has in many of our lives, right? So we can think of religion as maybe both uh, in the realm of formal and informal institutions. And one of my favorite recent papers comes from Oriol et al. Uh, I believe it was published in the QJE in 2020. And they essentially look at the relationship between religio uh, religiosity and religion and economic outcomes using evidence from Ghana and highlight how, for example, religious donations are viewed by many people as a substitute for formal insurance, right? So when you don't have access to formal insurance, you pray a lot. And you say, we hope that God will protect us, right? And you go to the church and you give donations in the church because partly you are trying to insure yourself against negative shocks. And so what they find is that when they introduce formal insurance, people then take up formal insurance and reduce religious donations to their churches. And that's my clock telling me I'm out of time. Um, almost done. So very, very important aspect, and thinking again, going back to Raquel's point on the role of policy in, sh in shocking cultural norms, and also then the importance, right? So people are using maybe what might be somewhat suboptimal ways of insuring against shocks. Maybe we should have more formal insurance so that people don't necessarily have to depend on you know, the church. Uh, same thing again, there's a, a new papers on thinking about how shocks increase religiosity. Very, very big area. This is one of the things I hope, you know, any grad students or junior scholars or senior scholars, anyone looking for a new research agenda, I think this would be a fantastic thing to study because we just know so little about this aspect of culture. And then finally, on race and ethnic discrimination, right? So there is a new, uh, not new, it's old, but hope that you're thankfully getting much more study with the, the new increased study on, on group-based inequality. But this is this literature on stratification economics that tries to understand the origins of persistent group-based inequality. Right? So you have this new issue in the JEL uh, that came out, uh, Solidarity, et cetera, and co-authors are trying to understand, again, what is the role of these informal institutions, formal institutions, and also what we don't really understand is trying to understand the role of the family, right? given that the family, again, is an important center of transmitting values. What is the role of the family in transmitting suboptimal values around race, race or ethnic discrimination that might then lead to persistent negative outcomes for group-based inequality. So two areas for further studies, and again, thank you very much to Raquel for a very, very interesting, very informative paper.
Okay, thank you very much. It was a great talk and a great set of provocative thoughts about how to move forward. Uh, let's open now the floor uh, to discussion. Uh, and uh, I can't see anything from here. Uh, who wants uh, to start then? Any hands up? <laughs> Too overwhelmed. <laughs> Okay, there's someone there, over there. Okay, uh, so thank you, Raquel, for a very interesting presentation. It was really nice to see a very you know, concise presentation of how culture and family interact and how it evolves. So uh, my question is more about, you know, uh, the culture being endogenous, right? So since the process is so slow, right, it takes a long time. And especially thinking about it, being transmitted through family members and you know how it happens, given that people who are going to be the losers from this cultural change are the ones who are in power at the moment, right? So it's, it's going to be very difficult to do this because it's not incentive compatible for them to support such cultural changes. So do we have any evidence of how this cultural change, you know, which is going to be very slow, how it can be accelerated or you know, how, do we know anything about that? Could you also introduce yourself briefly? And anyone else that asks questions as well? Sorry, yeah. I'm Nikita from the Indian Statistical Institute. Thank you. Okay. Can I? Okay. I'm Mariano Tomasi from uh, Universidad San Andres in Argentina. Uh, first, I just uh, remark to, um, to Raquel. At my age, I have difficulties sitting 40 minutes listening to a talk, but this time it was very easy, it was really very engaging, and very, very motivating. Uh, just two minor comments. In terms of uh, motivation for why we should study family, perhaps we might add the fact that all modern knowledge suggests that human development is so temporal dependent and everything that happens very, very early matters for your whole life. And obviously what happens very, very early happens in the context of the family. That's why the family is the main producer of human development in some sense. Uh, and connected to that, and we were chit-chatting here um, with Santiago about that, another crucial component uh, of family formation, cultural and characteristics of different societies are these patterns of uh, assortative mating. In some sense are the extreme version of some of the things you mentioned, but the more society-wide version of that. And as we were discussing here, there are little simulations there that show that if you were able to change the norm of positive assortative mating, you would reduce inequality in a dimension that no successful welfare state could ever do. Thank you. Shall I take a uh, couple more? Okay. Thank you very much. And I think first just to welcome the presentations. I mean, I found it quite insightful. Um, my name is Ayabong Agawe. I'm from the University of Front in South Africa. I, I have a question, and I think it, it came through from uh, Belinda's presentation around intimate partner violence um, and the link between that and some of the studies she'd looked at, uh, between that and cyclical male unemployment. And I'm quite interested in whether or not you've come across any studies that are able to look at the link between intimate partner violence and actually structural rather than cyclical male unemployment. Because I think one of the things we're dealing with in South Africa is not only you know, the significant incidence and prevalence of intimate partner violence, um, but also the interface between that um, and structural rather than cyclical male unemployment. And then maybe I think the second part of, of the question is around just the comment you are making around the role of social transfers in tilting the balance of power within the household. Um, so I'd be interested to hear just a, a bit more of your reflections on that. Thanks. Thank you. And one final one, maybe? Someone from this side? Would you like to start? Why don't we start with you, Raquel? Uh, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, it works. Um, so, 
there's no way I'm remembering anyone's name. And I barely could see where the fourth person was sitting. I never found him. So, <laughs> so let me start with, um, you know, cultural change. Again, the idea that it's going to be slow because it's going to take through generations. And then it's resisted by the older generation. And that then contributes to its slowness. I mean, I think there's a bit of truth in that, but there's also uh, evidence in other directions. First of all, not all cultural change, or maybe not even most cultural change, leads to intergenerational conflict. It, it can be within the same generation, the conflict. And so you would have one group that might want it and one group that may not. If you think about uh, women's uh, role in society, then there was this nice study by Washington, Abonya uh, Washington, which showed that uh, you know, uh, male uh, congressmen who had daughters were much more sympathetic about voting on female issues, positively on female issues, than those that did not. So again, there is an aspect of intergenerational altruism, which might get more turned on purely for selfish reasons, because you care about your daughters, or because knowledge, having daughters, makes you understand more what the consequences of certain views are, or certain cultural practices are. Second, in terms of examples, the one of uh, social change being fast, when you look at attitudes towards same-sex relation, and not just attitudes, but legal changes that have occurred in many countries in the world, not just the United States, not just Europe, but also Argentina, and I'm not sure if Uruguay also changed. And, but in any case, these are changes that, uh, you know, were very rapid in that scheme of things. And while it might be true that older generations, and you can show that, were more conservative, if you look at the same opinions, the same question and asked by generation, Older ones are, 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 are more conservative. Nonetheless, everyone changed. It's not just young generations who changed their minds. So even cultural beliefs that one holds at the age of 40 are subject to change. Uh, Mariano, thank you very much for your questions. Um, so I guess one question I would have is, is a sort of uh, mating, a sort of marriage a norm? or is it an incentivized practice? Uh, and I would argue that there is room for both in the sense that it's not, not so much I would call it a norm, but I would say one paper that I did with Nezi Gunner and John Knowles when I was studying assortative matching looked at the correlation, simply a correlation, but nonetheless very interesting, between the degree of assortative matching across countries and the degree of inequality across countries. The idea being, assume you're not Bill Gates for a second, the idea being that if you're giving up more to marry down, you're more to be less willing to do that. And what is giving up more means? Giving up more money, okay? So if you're gonna have a husband or a wife who is less educated than you, so I'm talking about sorting only at the educational level here, you're gonna be less willing to do so. And there's a very strong relationship in the data. On the other hand, what else goes on? You don't hopefully marry your spouse just for money, but you also love your spouse in the best of cases. And love is something that's fermented by spending time with people. So that's why people marry you know, in college or they marry in, with their graduate school classmate. You only marry the people you know and you tend to know people of the same background. Think about your PhD program, how many unfortunate PhD graduate women, and I'm kidding by the way, married PhD men because they were in the same class as them. But it's, it's true, not the unfortunate part, but women, because there's so few of them, uh, end up being disproportionately married in economics to another economist. Uh, and anyone who's ever tried to hire a female economist knows that a big question is, can you get a job for her spouse? So it's another burden that women f face, you know, not by choice and not because there's discrimination when they are in the economics job market. So please take that into account when you choose to marry. Uh, you know, so 
Um, I think if you mix people more, and I'm not talking about the elite levels now of college and, and graduate school, we don't care so much necessarily what happens there, though it has consequences. But if you think about secondary schools where you also meet people, you know, then imagine that you meet people from many more backgrounds than from, say, an elite background or for a poor background. And, you know, of course, this relates to Chetty's recent paper that found that schools that were more mixed people who were from poor backgrounds tended to do better, not necessarily through marriage, but maybe simply from peer effects uh, and studying, but also information, knowing that you should want to go to a good college, knowing that it's not that hard to get into a good college if you have good grades or having something to strive for. So in any case, I do think it can be very much affected by institutional structures in the country. I'm going to let... Uh, Belinda talk mostly about IPV and structural uh, issues. Good luck. <laughs> I will just add my own thing to that, uh, which is that um, that work is a little bit all over the place in terms of what it finds. So when we looked through that literature, we could not find you know, one conclusion. Uh, it's very hard to do structural because you need to find some source of variation to be able to do a rigorous analysis, and that's why a lot of the analysis looks at, uh, at uh, you know, cyclical fluctuations. Uh, I really would think that there's nice room for papers that look at, you know, not, I think that they look at how easy it is for men and women to divorce. I think it's not just that, it's also how easy it is for women to support themselves if they walk away. Uh, but right now, the, 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 the evidence is mixed. And lastly, on transfers and balance of power. So I think a lot of economists think that you give more money to women, uh, let's say with cash transfers, and they tend to be made better off. It makes them have a greater bargaining power in the family. And I think that's questionable, and we've seen more studies that say that's questionable, because in the end, it depends how appropriable that transfer is, okay? And so if you can be appropriate, or if the man resents it, as it happens to be the case with some of the studies on APV, actually they find that when women's employment goes up, women suffer more IPV incidents, because there is some, it seems to, uh, people seem to think that it's a psychological mechanism, a backlash mechanism against those things. And lastly, but not least, I really want to thank Belinda for her excellent discussion and for a lot of the papers that she brought to my attention, which we should have incorporated probably, but it's very hard to, it's like a running race, you're always behind. Uh, we, but we will certainly take them into account for the future, and I certainly want to read them, including very much yours. So I, I will just add one more thing. Thank you very much again, Raquel. I will add one more thing to the cash transfer. I think she answered the IPV. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know that literature as well. Um, so I'm Nigerian, and you know, the, the women in my family always said a woman should have a separate bank account that the man doesn't know about completely. I, 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 may, I take no stance, normative stance on that. I'm just stating the statement. Uh, and, and one of the things that this literature has started doing is to say, we'll have the cash transfers to women, and this is in the experimental stuff I see coming out recently, but we'll make it so that the woman can hide the amount that she's getting, right? And so they're starting to actually see that then, you know, the, the kind of women's saving, spending, et cetera, behavior changes very, very drastically depending on whether she can hide the amount that she's getting and, and this is in, Af in Sub-Saharan Africa, so you know, just uh, that's the context. But the, depending on the amount that she, she is getting in these like, experimental studies. So, so this just goes back again to highlight this point that you know, really understanding the cultural context is very, very important for us, especially as developing economists that are interested in influencing policy, right? Because it can very, very much change how the, the, your policy, like the impacts of your policy, uh, and, and, and you know, for good or for, for ill, and we hope for good, uh, but by studying these informal institutions, you can then much, much, much better uh, frame effective policy for development. So, just to add that there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a couple quick questions, if anyone wants to come back into the debate. And I still have difficulty seeing. Anyone? No? Okay, then I have, uh, there's someone there. Okay, sorry, can, 
the, the lights are impossible. There's, there's someone right there. Microphone, please. Uh, thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, really excited about it. And uh, my name is Yasmin Abdel Fateh. I'm from uh, University of Prince Edward Island, Cairo campus. And I just want a little elaboration on the saving for the women. I believe it's really crucial, uh, especially for developing countries. So if you would like give us more on the literature that's uh, been done, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. And yes, I, I, I don't know if we can send, if we post some of the resources, definitely Raquel's paper, and uh, you know, we can post some of the references for, the, for this newer experimental work on that. Yeah, thank you. And we have two more questions from this side here. Yeah. Hola. Por favor, le traduce. <laughs> Jolima Jaime de la Universidad Sur Colombiana Neiva. Bueno, eh, decían que Hay culturas en donde cuando hay dotes, las, las mujeres les dan más educación, ¿sí? Mi pregunta es si esa educación que se le dan a las niñas, eh, ¿qué tipo se ha mejorado en calidad como para disminuir esas brechas, esas violencias de género, para que ellas como que tengan más eh, empoderamiento en sí mismas y pues que las familias, esa cultura familiar de violencia de género en donde solo el hombre es el que manda y la mujer es la sumisa, ha ido cambiando, ha ido mejorando en ese sentido. Thank you, uh, Neaz Asadullah from Monash University in Malaysia. My question is to Raquel, and it relates to the definition of uh, culture, where you include social norm. But when I was reflecting on the lecture and thinking of certain social problems we face, such as early marriage, there is, and again, female labor force participation, there is equal emphasis and often separation of culture and social norm. For example, issues of sanction and uh, stigma, therefore, their papers and interventions targeting changing community social norm, leaving aside family-specific cultural practices. So therefore, um, as if there is a two-horse race, and uh, if we were to bet, uh, which one would you put your money on? That will, for example, if we were to address this problem of uh, mass early marriage, which is a problem in South Asian, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in certain parts, that will, whether you would advocate reforms that would bring about changes in family-specific culture, or would you promote interventions that would focus on shifting community-specific social norms? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, we have about 30 seconds for <laughs> replies. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, so the first one was about education, and IPV, uh, that was a question that was asked in Spanish. I'm gonna answer in English, is that okay? Because I want everybody. So the, the question was, when we see these women's education go up, do we see, not, not IPV, but necessarily violence towards women go down? And I don't know uh, of studies that have looked at this, I know that in the cross section, uh, more education is associated with uh, less reported violence, at least, uh, in the household. Uh, but I don't know that for these sort of changes, uh, which are induced by policy, uh, I don't know of any study that has looked at it, and maybe, maybe Belinda does. And, and then for culture versus social norms, you know, I know Jan Elster relatively well, and we would always get into discussions about social norms versus culture. I do not make a distinction. I know that some people do. 
I do not make a distinction between the two. And so whether you should focus on changing family culture versus the norms, say, of society or the culture of society, I mean, they, they kind of go together. So I think it's what, what you're trying to incentivize or to change and how you would target it. And it may not be by trying to show, oh, you should have a different norm or that your social norms are bad, but by maybe in the economic changes that incentivize the social norms. Although there's evidence, uh, for example, there's uh, two papers that explore uh, soap operas and the uh, penetration of cable TV, one in Brazil for the soap operas, cable TV in the context of India. Um, and they show, uh, the, for, the cable, for the soap operas, they depicted families that were much smaller in size than the tr traditional families that these people actually had. And what they show using variation in the cable TV's ability to penetrate that area, so actually receive the signal, they show that that seems to have changed uh, people's, people's uh, fertility outcomes. So people ended up having fewer kids in those areas where you, they watched women uh, having maybe zero kids or one kid in, in the soap opera. And, and then for the cable TV, they also found changes in women's, ro um, for cable TV in India, they found you know, changes in people's ideas of what women's roles are and also the amount of agency that women had. So particularly how much they were allowed to go outside on their own uh, unaccompanied and things like that. Uh, let me turn it over to Belinda. I don't, what, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then uh, I have to bring this to the end. We're a little bit late, but uh, I'll ask you for another round of applause to our friends. Yes.